I'm sorry, we're going to start in Joshua chapter 6 tonight. Joshua chapter 6. I'm quieting my phone. You might want to do the same. Phone went off in the service one time, and the guy couldn't find it, and it was ringing. And, you know, it's the elephant in the room. Everybody's looking. And uh, I, eventually I just broke the tension said, it's the devil calling. He laughed. He said, it's my mother-in-law. So, so now I don't say that anymore because I have a really good relationship with my mother-in-law. I don't want to ruin that. All right. My mother-in-law and I go out on coffee dates together. She likes that and I like it. All right. We're in Joshua tonight. How many of you know uh, George Mueller, that name? You didn't know him, but you knew the name George Mueller. Okay. He was most known for what ministry? Ministering to orphans. And yet, really interesting, Mueller said he did not start his orphanages primarily to take care of children. You think, why else would you start an orphanage? He knew they would benefit, but do you know why he started it? He lived in the 1800s. It was a time when Darwinism was beginning to turn people away from the faith. German rationalism had come in, and there was skepticism toward the Bible. A lot of people doubted the reality of God the power of God, and Mueller said, I'm going to start a ministry that will prove to the world there's a God in heaven who hears and answers prayer. And I just was reading some of his autobiography this year, and I was reminded of that. Yeah, he's going to take care of kids. God promises a blessing on those who take care of widows and the fatherless, right? But he said, I want to prove to the world there's a God in heaven who hears and answers prayer. His life really typified what I remember hearing an evangelist say when I was in college. He said, young people, listen. You need to pray big prayers to a big God looking for big answers. That's a good life motto. Pray big prayers to a big God looking for big answers. Let me ask you, what's the biggest thing you've asked God for lately? What are you expecting God to do in your life? Sometimes we act like, well, I don't want to bother God. How can you bother a person who never sleeps, never tires, is everywhere at all times, and is all-powerful? We're not bothering God when we pray. In fact, we're glorifying God when we pray. I want to give you a message tonight I've entitled Pesky Persistent Praying. Pesky, you know what pesky is? It's the idea of intending to harass. Um, It's causing vexation. Maybe your kids do this to you. Can we, can we, can we, huh, huh, huh? And you think, okay, enough. But God wants us to be pesky. He wants us to persist in praying. I mentioned one night this week that Mueller was known for his immediate answers to prayer. 30,000 times he chronicled that he'd received answers to prayer in no more than one week's time, sometimes as little as one day. 30,000 times, no more than a week he spent praying about stuff and he got it answered. But there were numbers of times that Mueller prayed and the answer did not come immediately. One was he had five individuals that he prayed for every day to be saved. And he said, I started this when I was a young man. I prayed every day, whether sick or in health, whether on land or at sea. And He traveled 250,000 miles around the world by ship, quarter million miles around the world, imagine that. And he said, whether it's sea, on land, sick, healthy, whatever, I prayed every day for five different people to be saved. He said 18 months went by before finally one of the five came to Christ. So a year and a half went by. He said, I thank God for that one, kept praying. Then from that point, five more years went by. And finally a second one came to Christ. And he said, I prayed... Praise God for those two. Kept praying for the remaining three. Six more years went by. And finally, a third one on his list of five came to Christ. And and that had been 13 and a half years now, right? So he said, I kept praying. He said, I, I, or uh, 12 and a half, sorry. I keep, keep praying, look to God for the answers. 36 years into this endeavor, he said, the two remaining on my prayer list have not been converted. They don't show any interest in being converted, but I pray on. I look to God for the answers. They're not converted yet, but they will be. And he kept praying. And listen to this. After Mueller died, the final two were saved. In the weeks after he died, it had been over 60 years that he had prayed. But finally, all five on that list that he persistently brought before God came to saving faith. Can you give any testimony to answered prayer in your life? You say, well, maybe not like that. Well, one of the key principles in the Bible is you have not because you what? You ask not. You have not because you ask not. Heather, you know, our tall daughter who's here. Heather, um, 21 now, when she was nine, she asked me a question that stumped me. You know, kids can ask those really good questions. She said, Dad, why do you think God wants us to pray? 
Now, I, I knew my child was not a heathen, okay? She had been saved. So uh, I said, well, what do you mean, hon? She said, Dad, God already knows everything. So even before we say it, he knows we're going to ask. Why, why do you think he wants us to bother to pray? I said, that's a good question. Let me think about that. I'm sure there are a lot of reasons for it, but one that came to my mind was this. You know, so often when uh, things go well, we don't think to praise God. Like today was a beautiful day. How many people in the world do you think today said, wow, now this was a great day God gave, gave us? I think the majority of Christians don't think that way. I, I hope that's not you. I repeatedly found myself saying today, Father, thank you for this beautiful day. This was incredible, right? But so often when things go well, God doesn't get any praise. However, as soon as things go bad, how often does God get the blame? I remember when the planes flew into the World Trade Towers on 9-11. Immediately people said, why is God doing this to America? Things go bad, God gets the blame. Things are good, how often does God get any credit? However, when you pray specifically and God answers specifically, guess who gets the praise? God does. Yeah. So one of the many reasons he says you have not because you ask not is because prayer is an opportunity for us to enter into the realm that is beyond our ability. We're, we're moving into the realm of the supernatural. I do not have the ability to do something supernatural, but God does. And we often say prayer changes things. I mentioned this earlier this week. Prayer changes things because on the receiving end of prayer is God. It's God who changes things. But he wants us to see his hand in answering prayer, in intervening in human affairs. So tonight I'm going to give you three pictures a prevailing prayer. And what does it mean to pray prayers that prevail? Well, look at that. So we're going to start with this. Number one today is from Joshua chapter 6. The principle is take another lap. Let's look there, Joshua 6. Now, I have verses 1 to 21 listed here. I'm not going to read every verse, but I want to give you the gist of it, all right? So look at Joshua 6, verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. The Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given into thy hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Ye shall compass the city, walk around the city, uh, ye men of war, and go around about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. The seven priests shall bear the ark, before the ark, seven trumpets of ram's horns. The seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. The priests shall blow with the trumpets, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. The wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Okay, so he gives them the strategy. It's very interesting. Joshua is the military leader. Remember, Moses was a prophet. But Joshua is specifically called as the successor to Moses, and he's known as a military leader. And what's military, what's militaristic about this strategy? Nothing. This is a reminder that uh, weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There is nothing militaristic about this, this scheme. In fact, uh, drop down with me. Pick up in, um, let's see, I want to do verse 12. Let's jump ahead, verse 12. Joshua rose early in the morning. The priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, went, up, went on continually, blew with the trumpets. The armed men went before but the re-reward, the guys in the back, came up after the ark of the Lord and the priests going on, blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned to the camp. So they did six days. came to pass on the seventh day they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. All right, now I'm going to get into the particulars here, but let me, let me backtrack for just a minute, okay? I want to give you some background. Go to the previous chapter, chapter 5, and I'm just going to pick up three verses here, 13 to 15, all right? Previous chapter, just before what we read, chapter 5, and let me give you some background to the story. Verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there stood, over a, uh, stood a man over against it with a sword drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said to him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? He said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said to him, What saith my Lord to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay, here's the background. The night before they're going to go into the city of Jericho, Joshua's scoping things out. And uh, he's trying to figure out, okay, where are we going to go up? And God hadn't revealed the plan yet. So Joshua's figuring out, how am I going to do this? 
And unexpectedly, he encounters a man who's got a sword drawn. And I can imagine Joshua draws his sword thinking, who is this guy and is this going to be a fight? And I've got no backup here. He was just there to do reconnaissance. He wasn't there to engage in battle. And he doesn't know who this person is. And interestingly enough, he says, are you for us, are you on our side, or for our adversaries? One of my favorite books outside the Bible is a book written by Ian Thomas called The Saving Life of Christ. Phenomenal book. He uses Old Testament accounts to give you a real picture of abiding in Christ, the abundant life. And the the theme of the whole book is summarized in one sentence. Ian Thomas says this, the death of Jesus for you was to put the life of Jesus in you. The death of Jesus for you was to put the life of Jesus in you. He didn't die for you just to give you a ticket to heaven. He died in your behalf and rose again that he might give his very life to you. Remember Colossians 3, 4, Christ who is our life. So the same way you got saved by grace through faith, that's how you live the Christian life. Christ is our life. So Ian Thomas's book is full of these pictures. Well, one of my favorite chapters is based on this particular text. It's called The Man with a Sword in His Hand. And Ian Thomas says, as Joshua encounters the man with a drawn sword, he wants to know, are you on our side or our adversaries? And he says, in effect, the man with a sword in his hand says this, I've not come to take sides, I've come to take over. That's well said. I haven't come to take sides, I've come to take over. For who is the man with a sword? Well, notice this. In the end of verse 14, it says, Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. And said, what saith my Lord to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. He's not at the tabernacle. What makes this place holy? Think about this. Whenever you see a man falling in the presence of another man, or even before angels in the Bible, typically what do angels or other men say to a person bowing before them? Do they say, here, kiss my ring? No, not in the Bible. What do they say? Get up, I'm I'm also a man. What does this one say? Take your shoes off. Why? Who is this? Go to chapter 6, verse 2. We read this earlier. And the Lord said to Joshua, that's the man with a sword in his hand. This is none other than the Lord himself. This is a Christophany. This is Christ in the Old Testament appearing before Joshua. And he says, I'm not coming to take sides. I'm coming to take over. Here's your game plan. Okay, so that's the background. Then we have the battle plan. What's the battle plan? I have to think, if I were one of the people of uh, Jericho, I I would be perplexed by this particular game plan. Now, interesting, the men on on the wall are there to keep an eye out. If they would be attacked, they have to alert everybody, right? So their job is to watch. So you can imagine a man with a spear and a shield, and all of a sudden, here comes this army. They think, do we alert? Do do we blast with the trumpet? What's going on? Interesting enough, the priests are in front, and they're blowing their trumpets, but nobody else is saying a thing. Now, uh, this is one that, I don't don't know if I can speak for all of you, but I know for Pastor and me, it would have been tough to have been in this crowd, because you weren't allowed to say anything. You know, we like to talk. So if you were in this crowd, you can't say a word, and they walk around the city. And the priests are blowing with the trumpet, and the guys are armed, but they're not lifting a weapon. They're just walking. And so I'm sure the guys on the wall are watching this thinking, what are they going to do? And they make one lap, and then they go back to their camp. And the guys on the wall must have thought, that is the strangest thing. So what happens the next day? Same thing. Here they come again. And they take another lap. And what happens then? They go back to their camp. Third day. All right, must be the attack today. It's the same method of operation. They go MO. They go around the camp, or the walls rather, and go back to camp. Fourth day, what happens? Same thing. Fifth day, same thing. Sixth day, same thing. You know, they can't figure this out. What are these guys doing? On the seventh day, figure by now, they got this down. Oh, here they come again. I mean, what is this? Some kind of psychological warfare? These guys just take a lap around, and I'm sure the guys in the wall are like, okay. Hey, coffee break, or whatever it was they would take a break with, you know. Okay, coffee break. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, they, they're going around again. And then they go around again. And they go around again. And another time, that's four, and another time, five, another time, six, another time, seven. And after the seventh lap, and this took all day, they blow with the trumpets, and what happens? The people give a great shout, and the walls fall down flat. Now, who knocked the walls down? God did. 
Why did God have him walk around the wall? It's a reminder, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, 6 reminds us that when it comes to spiritual victory, it's got to be God who does the work. And I already mentioned from 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. You know what strongholds are? They're the walls of a different city. And God brought down the strongholds. It was God who answered prayer. I really believe take another lap is one of the first pictures we see, or one of the vibrant pictures we see in Scripture, of prevailing prayer. Let me show you another one. Let's go backward in history. Go to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. You know, I've wondered, if I were in the medical profession, and I were not a believer, and I think uh, there are a lot of people in the medical profession that are not believers, but you know a lot of Christians who, they'll tell their doctor, hey, I'm praying for you, i got my whole church praying for you, and you've heard the stories, medical studies show that people who are prayed for fare much better than people who are not prayed for. And if you don't believe in God, you may be perplexed by that, but they can't deny it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's observable. So they must be thinking, yeah, what is the deal? It's like these guys in the wall saying, take another lap. Well, let me show you another one of those pictures that must have left the skeptics scratching their head. It's Exodus 17, verses 8 to 16. Would you look there with me? Exodus 17, verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose us out, men. Go out, fight with Amalek tomorrow. I'll stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him. He fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up, and up to the top of the hill. It came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone, put it under him, and he, and, uh, he sat there on. Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. His hands were steady till the going down of the sun, and Joshua discomfited. That's a word for he completely routed. He utterly defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for memorial in a book. Rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the, uh, the name of it Jehovah Nissi. That means the Lord our banner, a banner like a flag that would be Lead the, the point man leading into battle. Okay, the Lord, our banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, the Amalekites were real people. This is the first battle that Israel faces as they go wandering in the wilderness. And, and who does Amalek picture here? Amalek is a picture of the flesh. This is a real historic event. So don't forget, these are not Bible stories. These are real events. But what's the picture? Amalek is consistently a picture of the battle you and I have, flesh lusted against the spirit, spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to the one to the other, so you cannot do the things that you would. Okay, so how do you and I get victory over the flesh? Jesus said, without me you can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. That's John 15, 5 and Philippians 4, 13. So in our own power, we can do nothing. I remember hearing my dad preach when I, um, he was Sunday school teacher, and he was teaching from Romans chapter 8. And one day he was talking about Romans 8, 8. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. And he said, let me tell you, class, only God can please God. I'm 15 or 16 years old at the time, and I thought, only God can please God. Well, what about their, like Enoch? You know, he had this testimony that, that he walked with God. And, and, you know, hast thou considered my servant Job a perfect and upright man? So I asked my dad later, I said, Dad, I'm kind of confused. You said in Sunday school today that only God can please God. What did you mean by that? He said, well, remember what you're talking about, Rich. Any work done without God's enabling is a work in the flesh. All our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. He said, look, we all know that beating somebody ruthlessly is a work of the flesh. We know that immoral acts are works of the flesh. But he said, think about this. Singing a solo so people will look at you or witnessing and saying, I led so many people to Jesus Christ or... So hearing people say, that was a great message you preached. Well, thanks. If it's done in the flesh, it doesn't please God. Only God can please God means it's got to be God enabling us, God energizing us, or the work does not please God. That made sense when I, when I read in the scripture, this I said, and walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's the energizing of the spirit of God. It's the Holy Spirit working through us. If you don't know Christ as Savior, you can't please God. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So only God can please God. It's not that you and I can't please God, but it's when we are pleasing God, it's because we're walking in His Spirit. 
It's walking by his enabling. Okay, so I wondered here, the picture of Moses. He says, okay, we're going to be attacked. Now, remember, they're, they're wandering through the wilderness. They are not a, a, a band of marauders. They are not a, a warrior band. They're just a traveling band, but they got attacked. So they had men who were armed. They were not seasoned soldiers, but he says, all right, Joshua, you organize the men. I'll go up on top of the hill, and I'll hold up the rod. Now, what's the rod? That was Moses shepherd's staff, you remember? And after he had been to Egypt, he spent the next 40 years then tending sheep in the backside of the desert in Midian. In fact, uh, think about this. He goes from the top of the social chain to the bottom because we're told that the, that the profession of shepherds were despised by the Egyptians. So he goes from prince of Egypt to a shepherd. And remember that's when he encountered God at the burning bush? And uh, when he drew nigh to see what was going on, the Lord spoke out of the bush, you know, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, the place where on thou standest is holy ground. I mean, a desert floor, how's that holy? It's not holy because of the desert sand. It's holy because of the presence of God. He said, put your shoes off your feet. So Moses takes off those sandals and he falls down before the Lord, and that's where the Lord called him. So after that point, God had told him, all right, you're going to go before Pharaoh, and I'm going to use this rod as a sign before Pharaoh. God said, throw your rod on the ground. So when he did, it became a what? A snake, yeah. So he grabbed it, and then God told him, grab it by the tail. That would be a test of faith. I don't like to grab snakes, period. But if I had to grab them, I sure don't want to grab them by the tail. So he grabs it by the tail, and instantly it comes back to being the rod. He says, now, Pharaoh won't believe this. Put your rod in the water, and when you do, what will happen to the Nile River? Turn to blood. The water will turn to blood, right? And then he did other miracles there with the ten plagues. So that staff became known as the rod of God. It was Moses' shepherd's staff. But you see, God is able to take ordinary ability and turn it into extraordinary ability by his power. So Moses says, I'll go stand up on the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So while he's holding up the rod, Israel's winning. But after a while, just like any of us, he's getting tired. And as soon as the rod drops... The Amalekites start winning. No, time out, just a minute. When I read that, I thought, oh, Lord, do you have to be so picky? You know, no, I don't, please, please listen. These are conversations I have with the Lord in reverence of spirit. I'm not accusing God of anything, but did you ever think that? Lord, do we have to be, you know, among humans, we'd say so ticky-tack, you know, does this have to be so? What's the big deal whether the rod's up all the way or not? Because the rod was a picture, it has to be God because it's not going to be done by human power. So what happens? Moses has two uh, assistants come. One's his brother, Aaron. The other one's her. Not him, but her, but her is a him. Okay, so who is her? Interestingly enough, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that her was Moses' brother. Now, if that's true, he would be married to whom? Miriam. Miriam. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that. I don't know that for sure. I don't think uh, Josephus would have reasons to make that up. I can't tell you that in the authority of Scripture. So I'm not telling you I know for sure that's Miriam's husband. But it's interesting. I bring it up because if it was his brother-in-law and his brother, what a picture. How many times families work against each other, but what a blessing when families work together for the things of God. Now, we know Aaron's his brother, so no matter what, whatever relationship her was, but both these guys come alongside. By the way, your pastor needs people who'll come alongside and hold up the rod with him. What, what rod? Praying for him. That's why we've, we've, a couple of us have get, gotten together each night to pray ahead of time, because, you know, it's not words that change people's lives. It, it, God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Okay, but the preaching of the cross is to them perish foolishness, but to us which are saved, it is the power of God. That's why your pastor needs you to hold up his hands. And I believe holding up the hands is another picture of prevailing prayer. So they come alongside and they keep that hand held up and Israel wins the battle. Sometimes we say, well, you know, I don't know why God's not doing something in our church. I mean, we pray. Okay, but let's be real. How much do we really pray? Sometimes I think we have a heavenly wish list, but we don't engage in a whole lot of active praying. We got a lot of stuff we wish God would do, but how much do we literally engage in the activity called prayer? So the picture here is hold up them hands. I came up with that statement as I thought, you know, if, if during days of slavery, you know, some of these uh, African slaves who came to saving faith, they wrote songs like the old account was settled long ago and swing, swing low, sweet chariot. 
if some of them had read this text of Scripture and written a song from it, they might have called it, Hold Up Them Hands. That's the picture. The hands need to be held up. So, tear down them walls, hold up them hands. There's one last picture. It's in Luke chapter 11. I want you to go over there with me. Luke chapter 11. This is in the context of one of the most important passages on prayer in the Bible. It's in the context of the Lord's model prayer. Now, we sometimes hear it referred to as the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer wasn't actually a prayer that Jesus prayed. He gave it to teach how to pray. His disciples, in fact, asked him to teach them. Look at verse 1 here. It came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples sent to him, or said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now let me, let me just give you a perspective here. I've got verses 5 to 8 written down. The, the section on prayer actually goes from verse 1 down to verse 13. It wrote down like this. I don't have it on the slide, but if you want to kind of have a little bit of an organization in your mind, there is a pattern for prayer in verses 1 through 4. Okay, that's the model, the pattern for prayer. Then there's a parable concerning prayer, and I'm going to get into that here in a moment. And then there are principles regarding prayer. So there's a pattern, verses 1 through 4, a parable, verses 5 to 8, and then principles, verses 9 to 13. That's how this breaks down. i got to tell you, as a kid growing up, when I went to a, uh, a United Methodist church that did not preach the gospel, we were members, we went every Sunday it, it didn't matter. I, from the time I was in the nursery, I was in church. We never missed. Even when we went camping, we'd find a church in our denomination and go there, right? The only scripture I ever heard was the Lord's Prayer. And it was quoted like some Gregorian chant. We'd all stand and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It sounded like a robot saying it. And frankly, after that, whenever I'd hear the Lord's Prayer, I'd kind of tune off like, Oh yeah, the Lord's Prayer. I grew up hearing that. Well, the sad thing is, it's one of the most important scriptures, but it was never explained to me. And one day, somebody gave me a message. It was by a preacher who, when he was in college, he promised God he would spend an hour a day with God in prayer. And he had kept it up. In his adult life, he, this was uh, Johnny Pope, Texas. He said, I, I promised God I'd spend an hour a day with him in prayer. And he had done that all through his adult life. He developed a sermon from this passage of Scripture that was a seven-part series. And I had a single, this was a cassette back then. I had a cassette. A pastor in Iowa said, would you preach the entire seven-part series in one night? And it was like an hour and 45 minutes. And even then, he was just cutting and pasting, you know, to get it down to an hour. And a, He said, I don't care how long it takes. I want you to do the whole thing in one night. I listened to that thing over and over again. I finally wrote to the church. He pastored in Houston, Texas. Uh, still does. And I said, could I have the whole seven-part series? So they sent it to me. Now, back then, it was on cassette. And I remember I was washing and waxing my truck and trailer, which, when they're as big as I have, it takes all week, right? So I'm out there washing, waxing, and I've got my Walkman on. Remember Walkman? You know, and my cassette with little fuzzy ear things. And I'm listening to this thing, and I will tell you something, that message on prayer changed my life. It makes sense that somebody who lives prayer might be able to make an impact in your life on the subject of prayer. And he pointed out this um, in the teaching. They said, teach us to pray. One of the reasons I preach every week something on prayer is because prayer is a learned discipline. It's teach us to pray. John taught his disciples. What John do you think he's talking about? John the, yeah, John the Baptist evidently taught his followers and Jesus taught his followers. So I'm preaching, I'm teaching people how to pray because it needs to be learned. And, and notice this, he said, hallowed be thy name. That's praise to God. Thy kingdom come. That's petition for souls. And you don't have to get all this down. I'm just giving you an overview. So it's praise and petition for souls. And then thy will be done as in heaven, so on earth, purpose in life. Give us day by day our daily bread. What, what P might go with give us our daily bread? Provision. Provision of needs. Forgive us our sins. Pardon. Yeah, pardon our sins. For we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Protection from evil. Okay, so that's just a basic overview. That's another message for another time, but that's the pattern for prayer. Okay? Then he illustrates, and this is what I have on the slide before you. I call this slide, this principle, keep knocking at the door. 
Okay, and here's where it comes from. Verse 5. And he, Jesus, said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, shall go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me. I have nothing to set before him. He from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say to you, though he will not rise and give him, because he's his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will arise and give him as many as he needeth. Now I want you to notice the word importunity there. I once heard Pastor Jim Shetler, who was my pastor, and then later on he went down to be on staff at West Coast in, um, at Lancaster Baptist Church. Brother Shetler preached the message one time called the most important word in the Bible concerning prayer. Now that's quite a title, the most important word in the Bible concerning prayer. And he alleged that this word importunity was the most important word. Hmm. And I wondered, okay, why did he say that? Well, let me give you his definition of the word importunity. It is the best I've ever heard, okay? The word importunity means persistence to the point of being a pest. Persistence to the point of being a pest. Like, have you ever had children come to you and say, hey, after church, could we go out for ice cream? And being the dad that I am, I've often said, yeah, that sounds pretty good. You know, let me talk to mom. And so five minutes later, they come and say, hey, are we going for ice cream? I said, now, I haven't had a chance to talk to mom yet. I'll get back to you, right? And five minutes later, she comes back and says, so, are we going? Going what? For ice cream. At that point, I say, hey, listen, you ask again, the answer is what? No. Have my kids done this to you? No, probably your kids have done this to you, right? Okay. Here's where we're so different than God. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know the, I know the reference. Do you know the reference for that? It's Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. That is such a, a, a pivotal scripture, such a seminal scripture. You ought to memorize that verse, those verses. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God's thoughts aren't our thoughts. His ways aren't our ways. He's omniscient, and we know so little. This is one of those areas we are so not like God. We say to our kids, you ask again, no. God says, keep asking. I'll illustrate from what Jesus gave here. He says, who would have a friend at midnight? Now listen, people normally didn't show up at somebody's house at midnight. It wasn't safe to travel late like that. But for whatever reason, delayed or what, this buddy shows up, and the man didn't expect his friend to come. I mean, they didn't have texting back then. They didn't, you couldn't call on a telephone. They didn't have a telegram or telegraph. They had tell a woman, but apparently word had not gotten there ahead of time. So, you know, they, they don't have a way to notify him. So the guy shows up at midnight, and now he's thinking, oh, no, i got to be a good host. Well, here's one thing you did not do. You did not serve your friend leftovers. Day, old, bread, no, no. Because think they didn't have any preservatives in the bread. So any of you make homemade bread? If you don't have preservatives in the bread, it's going to go dry pretty quickly, right? So you did not serve day-old bread, so you only serve fresh bread. Well, he didn't know the guy was coming. But then he remembers, oh, my neighbor across the street, he's got, he's got bread. Well, it's midnight. Who is it? It's uh, Jedediah, your neighbor. Jedediah, I cannot come. The kids are all in bed. Now, when he said they're all with me in bed, I thought, oh, serves you right, bud. Why are you putting them in your bed? Well, probably, they, a lot of them lived in one-room houses, and they put the kids on the floor in what like we do, a sleeping bag or a pallet. So you know how it is when you finally get the kids settled. He doesn't want to wake them all up, but finally he comes to the door. What is it? Listen, I'm so sorry, but a friend of mine showed up. I know you made bread today. How many you need? I just need three. Here, as many as you need. Now, I had another pastor one time who preached a message. I'll never forget the title. The title was, God is not the grouchy neighbor. <laughs> and like you, I was thinking, so is God the grumpy guy in this? No, of course not. God is not the grouchy neighbor. How do I know that? Well, there's a similar parable in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 to 8. It's the unjust judge. You remember the woman who comes and she says, avenge me of my wrong, and he won't hear it. <laughs> we, judicial activists, you know, we got some in our day. And so he's not going to, do, he doesn't care. She's not part of the good, good old boys network. She keeps coming. And finally he says this, though I do not fear God nor man, I'm going to grant her petition, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Now, is God the unjust judge? No. The Bible is very clear. God is not an unjust judge. So who's the unjust judge? He's an unjust judge. 
Who's the grouchy neighbor? He's a grouchy neighbor. What's Jesus' point? If you can get something from a grouchy neighbor or from an unjust judge through persistence, how much more will you receive from God when you persist? Because God is not an unwilling giver. The reason God wants us to persist, you remember the, uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, and he said, I will not let thee go except thou what? Bless me. This is, so, this is foreign to human thinking, but I want to tell you, this changed my prayer life. Don't take no for an answer if no is not the answer. The word importunity, again, means persistence to the point of being a pest. Okay, you want further proof of that? L look at verses 9 and following. Verse 9, these are the principles concerning prayer. I say to you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, he that seeketh findeth, to him that knocketh it shall be opened. All right, ask, seek, and knock. Now, they're all verbs, right? They're all action verbs. Let me just tell you about them. You say, well, maybe you think grammar's not my thing. But you need to understand this. The grammar there, ask, seek, and knock, you get the idea it's not just a one and you're done, right? In fact, linguists call this linear action. Now, I'll explain this to you. It's really simple. I was not very good in math, but I do remember a few things from geometry, Okay. In geometry, we have a, a significant difference between a line segment and a line. Okay, Remember, a line segment go from one point to another, like x to y or a to b or whatever. So that's a line segment. But by definition, a line goes on how far? Infinitely. Yeah, inde indefinitely, right? Linear action, it would be like saying this. Ask, 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 dot, dot, dot. Seek, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Knock, 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 knock. And you're like, all right, I get it. That's the idea. Keep going. Look at verse uh, 12. He says, uh, verse 11, sorry. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? You know, what, what father, where, kid says, Dad, can I have an egg? Here, eat, eat this stone. Have some bread here, play with a scorpion. I mean, even depraved fathers would not do that to their children. Look at verse 13. If ye then, being evil, evil means sinful, if you evil dads know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Now, by the way, the context of the Holy Spirit here is not that you receive the Holy Spirit by asking. Once you're saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Romans 8 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Ephesians 1 13, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Here, the emphasis is on the enabling of the Holy Spirit, the energizing, the, um, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, how does that come? Yeah, and you ask. You're asking, Lord, I need you to fill me. I, I, without you, I can do nothing. So I need you to enable me. That's why I don't, I, I rarely enter meetings without some prayer meeting beforehand because I don't think I'm going to change anybody's heart and mind. It's got to be God that does that. And he does it in answer to prayer. John R. Rice, the famed evangelist, had a dream one night. He'd been writing on the topic of prayer. And this, this was not a revelation from God kind of dream. But he had a dream that he had died. He was now in heaven. And God the Father himself was giving John Rice a tour of heaven. And he said, we're seeing these mansions, palatial rooms. It was overwhelming. But he said, we stopped at looked to me like a storage closet. And he said, he opened up the closet, God the Father, and inside was a whole storage closet full of presents, gifts, all gift-wrapped, bows, paper. And John was curious, and he said, Father, what is this? He said, the father replied, my son, these are all the gifts I would have given my children had they just asked me one more time. Hmm. Now, that wasn't some inspiration from God, but why was he thinking that? He'd been meditating on these principles. The principle of importunity is keep asking. I told you about George Mueller and how he prayed and prayed and prayed. You say, yeah, why, why do we have to pray and pray and pray? Because when such an answer comes, well, there are a couple reasons. One is God doesn't just override human volition. Men have wills, and God doesn't just run roughshod over their will. He'll work on their will. He'll work on their heart, and he'll, he'll make them malleable. He'll work on them if 
That's why he says, if, you, if there be a willing heart, a ready heart. God preps that. God, Jesus says he draws all men to himself. Now, does everybody get saved? Nope. But he promises he'll draw all men to himself. That's why you've got to pray for the sinner. Pray for God to work in their heart. But the other thing is this. When you and I pray persistently and we rely on God utterly and God answers, we know who did it. I met a lady up at that church I was telling you about in uh, Wisconsin. I told you yesterday I was preached to a staff of churches 600 and what. A lady came to me that week. I'd preached on prayer another message, and she said, you know, you told that George Mueller story. She said, i got to tell you this. She said, my mom was a very devout religious woman. She always thought that her good works would get her to heaven. And she said, brother, we prayed for my mom for 50 years. Every single day we'd pray for my mom. She said, brother Rich, my mother got saved at age 101. She said, you tell people out there, don't quit praying. Then she said, I thought that would be the greatest answer to prayer I could ever record. Until my dad got saved, she said, brother, when my dad got saved, he was 105. 105 years old. What's the, what's the picture? Tear down, them, tear down those walls. Take another lap. Hold up them hands. Keep knocking at the door. Why are those pictures in Scripture? Because when we're praying prevailing prayer, we are saying, God, I am utterly powerless to do this, but I am totally dependent upon you who, who are, you, God, are all powerful. That's why I'm coming to you. Some people say, well, I've tried to witness to my family. I've tried to convince them of their need. They just won't hear it. Listen to this. When you can't talk to men about God, you can always talk to God about men. That's where prevailing prayer comes in, intercessory prayer. Paul wrote this to Timothy. I will, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. 1 Timothy 2.1. Folks, we need to pray. Take another lap. Hold up them hands. Keep knocking at the door. Those are pictures from Scripture of relying upon the total power of God. That's what prayer expresses. One fellow said it so well. I'll close with this quote. A day without prayer is a boast against God. A day without prayer is a boast against God. Owen Carr made that statement. And I thought about that. You know, when we don't pray, basically we said, thanks God, but I got this today. None of us would verbalize that, but that's what prayerlessness says. A day without prayer is a boast against God. Would you bow your head with me tonight? Thank you for...